Yeah. Bills Mafia. Don Brown. Yeah. It's the mafia, you know I'm rocking with the bills. It's the mafia, you know I'm rocking with the bills. It's the mafia, I'm with the Buffalo Bills. It's the mafia, you know I'm rocking with the bills. Hey, hey. Who you repping? What's your team? Who you repping? What's your team? You know I'm repping for my team. I got that challenge on my team. Mike a high Jordan Boyer, can you catch bills it? Mafia, you what trade day is like a and match. Welcome you're not catching into anything. The Bills Brawl. This is the Friday show uh, called the Podcasters Corner. I am your host, Charlie Gross, and I have with me the host of the Talking Buffalo podcast, Mr. Patrick Moran. Pat, how you doing? Doing good, Charlie. Good to uh, be on the podcast. Looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we got to connect. You know, there's there's so many podcasters in the uh the buffalo market that i try to have everyone on and and i was i said to myself you know i've never really talked to pat i've interacted with him on twitter uh i really respect what you've done with your brand which we'll get into in a second but yeah i said man i gotta get this guy on here yeah well thanks man i appreciate it and you ain't lying about saying that there's a lot of podcasters in the buffalo market whether they actually live in buffalo or not and include, include me amongst those who don't, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a crowded market, but it, it's a fun market. And for the most part, it's a, uh, it's a quality market because not just a lot of good podcasts, but a lot of good people behind the microphone doing the podcast when it comes to Buffalo content. Definitely. I, I, when I first started two years ago, a lot of people who I had no clue who they were and they didn't know who I was, were certainly very helpful to me when I reached out to them. And the reason I kind of wanted to start this is, I've I've run into some issues that I think anyone would would run into, and, and I figured instead of DMing people and sort of talking behind the scenes, I'd sort of bring it to light and you know get some advice from people and talk bills and and maybe if somebody else out there wants to start a podcast and they're not sure how to go about it, I think this would be really uh, would be good for people. You've done a great job. Well, first of all, when did you start and, and how how did you start? I guess we should start there. Well, uh, you want the short version or the long version? Whichever one you want, you want to give us. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let me say this. The reason I wish that I could tell you that I had this fun, elaborate, creative reason to start the podcast. But at the end of the day, I, I started the podcast because I was bored off my ass. That's that's the God's honest <laughs> truth. So now I'm from Buffalo and I lived in Buffalo my entire life with the exception. I spent a little bit of time in New Jersey, and New York, but for the most part, I'm Buffalo born and bred. And I, for many years, dating back to the nineties, I was in the local rag newspaper scene. Like I wrote for, for a lot of sports papers, you know, like the little local rags, at least mm-hmm. back in the day, there were a lot of them, not really so much anymore. And then I got into blogging in the, like, around 2006, something like that. So I blogged for quite a number of years, built up some pretty good contacts, some relationships, kind of got burned out from that around, I don't know, maybe 2014 or so. And then in 2016, my wife, who works for a company in Buffalo, their headquarters are down here in Florida, she was offered an opportunity to transfer down to Florida, get a nice promotion, some perks, things like that. And again, headquarters were down here. So we talked about it and I had us, we have a son who was at that time, he was in seventh grade, getting ready to go into eighth grade. And he was a well-established uh, little loop football player. He was, he's a good football player. And I know through doing research or just through knowing and being a sports fan my whole life, I know that Florida along with Texas are the hotbeds for high school football. And uh, so we factored that in and my wife's career and the fact that we had never been anywhere else. I had never been anywhere else, really. So we decided to move down here in Florida in the summer of 2016. So I came down here. I worked from home. And over the course of, I don't know, time, maybe a year or so, started getting bored, started missing blogging a little bit. I was Write a couple things here and there, but it wasn't really doing a trick for me anymore. And at that point, I start, there were a couple podcasts 
Buffalo sports wise that I was listening to not regularly because I wasn't in the podcast. And this is by the way, this is like mid to late 2017. Okay. But there was nothing that really I was into regularly, but I started watching some YouTube videos about podcasting and I just, I don't know, ideas just started running through my head and, and I got hooked. So kind of out of boredom, I was spending literally hours a day um, watching videos about how to start a podcast and all the steps because, and you you know this now, it, it's not as easy as it seems. At no. least for, <laughs> for most people, it's not as easy as it seems. There's a lot that goes into it, a lot to learn in terms of production and equipment and all that stuff. But anyway, I just got fascinated by it. And then in early 2018, I said, all right, I'm going to do this. So I spent some money. I got some gear and I had a strategy. I, I've known throughout the years, like I said, of being in and out of the Buffalo sports media, to some extent, I had developed some relationships and three key guys that I've known pretty well for quite a while is Sal Capaccio, uh, Tim Graham, and Tyler Dunn. So I decided I was going to start this podcast, which by the way, it's Talking Buffalo Podcast now, but originally I called it Analytics Podcast. So yeah, I that's talked- That's an impressive to, list, by the way. I mean-, I mean that, <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it was a good start. So um, I talked to Sal and I talked to Tim and I talked to Tyler and also like Jay Skursky too. And I said, listen, I want to start this podcast and it's just going to be long form interviews. And what I wanted to do differently than what I was listening to with other Bills podcasts is I didn't really care so much about talking about the Bills, the objective of the podcast. And to some extent, this still holds true today is I wanted to give fans an opportunity to know more about these people beyond just the work they do. You know, like you take a guy like, um, Take like Sal Capaccio, you know, you hear him on WGR, you know, he does radio, you know, he's the Bill sideline reporter, but not everybody knows his story. So what I wanted to do is talk about the life and the career of these people. And like I said, just give fans a, you know, kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and, and give fans, you know, just a chance to learn more about them beyond just when they're on the air, or just be when they're in front of the camera or the articles that they write, kind of a human interest element to it. So I had those guys on and those were like four of the first six guests I got. And from there, it's just kind of, you know, ambition and, and just building up. Once I had Sal and Tim and, and Tyler on, I was able to go out and get Buffalo people a lot easier. Like I had Sa Howard Simon on the show relatively early. I had Mike Harrington on relatively early. Now I know people, fans have a love hate relationship with Mike <laughs> Harrington. I get it. Trust me. I know Mike pretty well and I can see both sides. Right. I like Mike, right. but if people hate Mike, I know why. And I get it. All right. But anyway, I got that cast on those, that core. And then from there, I, you know, I just said, you know, I'm gonna shoot my shot, man. And I started getting some national people and I did that by using local connections. Like Ross Tucker used to play for the Buffalo bills. I reached right. out to him. I say, Hey man, I've, you know, you know, Tim Graham, you know, Tyler Dunn. I've had them both on my show. You know, would you like to be on the podcast? And they said, he said, yes. Uh, so from there, Richard Deutsch, which was a huge score for me. Uh, yeah. Richard, Richard who was at Sports Illustrated, I believe at the time. Now he's at the Athletic. But anyway, Richard Deutsch is a UB guy. And I really? used that connection to my benefit. Yeah, he's a UB guy. Um, Mike Vaccaro, who's a longtime, very well-known columnist for the New York Post, He's a St. Bonaventure graduate. And I talked to Mike Harrington and got his direct contact right through him. So I got those guys on. And ultimately, that would lead to getting Adam Schefter on the show. And after yeah. I had Adam Schefter on and we, he, I had him on, he did like a full hour with me too. It wasn't just like a radio hit. He did a full hour with me. And after that, you know, it just got easier. And I have people like Josina Anderson and Lee Steinberg and you know, Chris and Ledlow, to name a few. So it got easier after that. But I had a plan from the start, a process. But, you know, my long-winded answer to your question is, honestly, I was just bored. And I just really was, I wanted to talk to, to interesting people. That's ultimately for me what it came down to. Just an opportunity to record conversations and have them with interesting people. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's kind of what I've discovered I think you did a great job of finding your lane. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to do. And that's why I kind of started this show is something a little different. There's 
there's so many podcasts and there's so many good podcasts. And my thought was, is how many game recaps can you really listen to? And I don't, you know, I don't disparage the people who do those because I listen to them. But at the same time, once I get to the 10th or 11th one, I mean, how many different ways can you, can you just recap the game right away? Like off the top of your head. Yeah. So I think it's really important to find your lane it, and it's obviously difficult with however many 50 podcasts, maybe that the bills have, it was there a moment for you and maybe it was Adam Schefter when you felt like, okay, you know, this is it or, or I've made it or, or something where, you know, you said, Oh wow. Like I like people are really listening now, you know, like you, you knew you had like a built in, audience that was gonna you you could see like see you know okay i'm getting 200 people consistent whatever it is was there a moment for you when that happened or was it just gradually a thing i think it was gradually a thing i don't think there was any one specific moment i mean obviously being able to and i still to this day kind of call it lucky to be able to get adam schefter on but you know i worked for that too i worked to get him on so i kind of earned it up to that point i think that's the point where i knew that i had outside credibility, like maybe outside of just people who already knew me. You know, when you start right. something, you got your your family, your friends, whatever following you have on Twitter that, you know, you talk Bill stuff with, they follow you kind of right from the start. They're on board from day one, but there's that next level that you got to get to. And it's not easy and, it, and it's humbling. You know, to this mm-hmm. day, I've done, I'm almost at 300 episodes now and I have some that you know, don't perform as well as others. Sometimes I've done some episodes where I look back and I want to kick myself because I could have been better. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's a, it's definitely a process. And you hit the nail on the head when you talked about having to stand out for for me, there's, there's two things I think when it comes to a podcast that are going to make people want to listen to you. Number one is you have some type of uniqueness to it and be a little bit different. And that's what I at least try to do. Now, again, I do have some episodes, especially during bill season where it is just straight bills talk. And I know I'm not really being unique, but that's just the way it is. But I do again, using the long form interview and I don't just have football talk, by the way, I have hockey, I have news media. I've had people from American Idol on the show. I've had people from the voice on the show. I try to mix it up a lot of news people, not sports, but news media personalities. So anyway, that's my attempt to to be different. And like I said, have these long form conversations that aren't necessarily about what they do, but a good example to me anyway, of a podcast that I consider unique is Tyler Dunn's new podcast, go along with Tyler Dunn. And he does it without Jim Manos, who was a, the Buffalo bills player uh, or a director of pro personnel for three years. That's a different podcast. And the reason being is by having Jim on the show and Doug Whaley's always on his show. He's got, that's cool. He's got a slant that you're not going to hear anywhere else. And he's done a really good job. And this is something to some extent, I feel like I did for quite a long time. And after a while, it gets hard to get unique guests on. Not once I do it twice a week. So twice a week over time, that gets hard, but Tyler's done a great job of having guests on that. You don't hear from often. He's had Lee Evans. And and by the way, his podcast has only been out for a couple of months, but he's already had Lee Evans on the show. You don't hear from Lee Evans often. Um, He's had Eric Moulds on his show. I don't hear from Eric Moulds often other than the no. occasional WGR radio hit. He had Dante Whitner on his podcast, who I personally do not like Dante Whitner at yeah, all. I don't know but, if anyone really. No, I really <laughs> don't. But my point being is all due respect because that's a good get. You know, Dante Whitner don't do interviews with Buffalo people. You never hear from him. But mm-hmm. I got him on. And he has unique perspective from people who are qualified that, you're not going to get anywhere else. So that's the one way. And then the other way, when you kind of said it with all the recaps and all this stuff, if you're going to do what everyone else is doing, you better do it better than anyone else. Like Bruce Nolan is the perfect example of that. I wouldn't say the Bruce, the Bruce exclusive is the most unique podcast out there, but that dude is as good or better than literally anyone else. I mean, he prepares, he knows his shit, you know? And, uh, right. His delivery, his production value, everything about it is just fantastic. So, 
Yeah, he's not the most unique guy, but he does it better. Yeah. Yeah, and I think he's so great at being analytical. And I'm like analytical, like I started my own analytics company, but but I'm still like not to the level that that Bruce is. And it's it's incredible to me. And he's so good at really breaking down something and really presenting both sides almost like at a micro level. And I, there's just not many people who can do that. And that's, I think that's one of the things too, that makes him so unique. He he doesn't, he also doesn't speak like a Bills fan. He is no. a Bills fan, but when he hits record on that podcast, he's an analyst. That's what he's doing. He is breaking down theories and he has his takes and, and his opinions and they're not biased because he's a Bills fan. I respect that. It's another thing about podcasting. If you're covering a team, if you want to, I'm, I mean, I guess if it's just going to be a hobby and you really don't care about who's listening and you just want to do it purely for fun and nothing else whatsoever, say what you want, who cares? But I feel like if you have a, and we're just talking Buffalo Bills here because we're both based with Buffalo uh, stuff. So we'll stick with them. But if you're a Bills podcast, and I feel like if you want the average person to take what you say serious, you have to be somewhat unbiased and objective. You can't always take the positive point when there is none. Now, when you're when the Buffalo Bills are 13 and 3, it's easy to, to find good things. If you're a Buffalo Sabres podcast right now, for an example, you know, mm-hmm. if you're talking positive about this team, I'm, I don't really want to hear much about it because there's not right. a lot to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's and another it's important thing. easier to talk about bad things than good things because things are going good. I mean, you, you know, you're like, hey, everything's great. You know, 38 to nothing on the next yeah. week. You know, but when the team is 4 and 12, there's lots of stuff to talk that this should be better and that should be better. So, yeah, for sure. No question about it. It's, and it's, you know, we were again. We at the end of the day, I'm a Bills fan. I don't try to hide from being a Bills fan. But when I hit record, if I got something negative, say if I got a problem with the way someone's playing, I'm not going to be afraid to 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 hit on that and to talk about that, and sometimes be harsh on a player or or team if they're playing badly. You know, it's just the way it is. And I think people might not always like what you have to say if you have that attitude. But I think for the most part, I think people are going to respect you more for being unafraid to be critical of the team that you cover and that you admittedly are a fan of. So that's important too, I think. I agree. Well, let's move into the team a little bit. Um, What were your thoughts? Because after the Bills lost to the Chiefs, that coupled with how the Chiefs lost to Tampa, I thought to myself, man, for a team that's 13-3, and they kind of seem pretty far away. And I started, I mean, you can say that they need offensive guard. They could use certainly another tight end because Knox, I like Knox, but he might be the only one left on the roster. You might need an upgrade at defensive end. Milano's probably gone. You're going to get a linebacker, cornerback two, big nickel for a team that won 13 games. I feel like there's pretty distinct needs and, the gap is maybe a little wider than than I thought after watching watching those two games. What are, what are your thoughts about where the Bills are and how what they have to do or how far away you think they are from the Chiefs or the or the uh, Tampa? Well, I'll say this: going into the Kansas City game, I thought Kansas City was Team One A and the Bills were Team One B in the AFC, and I don't think that now. I think Kansas City is one and Buffalo is two. You have to look at the totality of everything to kind of make your conclusion. Like for an example, the Super Bowl, all right? The Chiefs were god awful in that game. They had two tackles out, which got, I don't think it's ever been more obvious, maybe in the history of the Super Bowl, where having two injured players showed as much as it did that game. Because I mean, it was just, Patrick Mahomes was literally running for his life almost every snap because those tackles could not block either defensive end for Tampa. Couldn't stop them in any way. And Tampa wasn't even blitzing that much. It just, they couldn't block them. But anyway, right. that game aside, you're not going to write off Kansas City because they played terrible that game. They're still an elite team. I still think if they were to play that game tomorrow, I'd still think the Chiefs would win the game. I still think the Chiefs are 
the best team in the NFL because I'm looking at the totality of everything. Um, when it comes to the Bills, I don't think the gap is that big. I think it's just, I know this sounds like an easy solution and simple to say, but harder to do. They just didn't play well in that game. It was a very weird game because, you know, we could break down that AFC championship game for 10 hours. Do you know one point you probably wouldn't bring up? Because I've done it and I forgot about it. The Buffalo Bills led that game 9 nothing at one time. You know, they right. came out early. I mean, they caught a break. Tyreek Hill dropped a long pass on third down. And the Bills had kicked a field goal. They stopped Kansas City, again, because of a hill drop. And then the Bills punted. And then the special teams touched down, basically. It was like a three-yard touchdown yeah. drive for the offense. But basically, it was a special teams touchdown. But anyway, the Bills were up 9 nothing. I think the difference between those two teams isn't even as much physical right now as it is mental. I feel like, and this starts with the coaching staff. Look, I'm a big, big Sean McDermott guy. I campaigned that I thought he deserved and still think he deserved to be NFL coach of the year over Kevin Stefanski. And again, I'm not being a homer. I'm being honest. That said, the Bills did not have that. I think to beat Kansas City, you got to have a, a gun, a gunslinger killer mentality. You got to be confident in your guys and play to win and not try to out scheme or outsmart the opposition. And I think both times the bills played Kansas city this year, they fell victim to that. The first time they said, we're not going to let them beat us with the pass. And they ran for like 270 yards or whatever it was in Buffalo. The offense didn't look good and they only lost by nine, but it felt like they lost by a lot more. And then the AFC Championship game, it's just it, the settling for the field goals. It's just, I mean, and I know McDermott probably regrets that now, but it's just not the right mentality to have to play that team. You're not going to beat that team by not playing to win. I don't think the gap is that big, though. Let me say this. You know, the Bills were 13-3. and three. Going into that game, they were 15-3 and three if you count two playoff wins. And right. you look at the roster offensively, what more realistically realistically, can you really do? I say you can get maybe a veteran, a tight end who's a veteran, who's more reliable than Knox, who is a better, let's say, a, a better Tyler Croft, okay? And the running backs, that's where I could see something being done. And I've already been talking about this a little bit already this offseason. I think Devin Singletary's days in Buffalo might be uh, – on life support right now. I think. Really? Yeah, I do. I, I, they like Zach Moss. I don't think they trust Devin Singletary. Now that's not saying they're not going to go out and spend. If he even hits the market, they're not going to go out and spend $12 million a year on an Aaron Jones. They're not going to go out and spend a lot of money on a Kenyon Drake. But, and I know people, and this is a comeback I hear all the time. Well, the bills have used third round picks and back to back drafts on running backs. Okay. Brandon Bean's not afraid to cut a loss if it's not a good pick. I don't think Devin Singletary is a very good running back. And that really happened in the last year. I liked him his rookie year. Did not like him this year. I could see a scenario where the Bills, whether it's another draft pick, but I don't think so. I think it's more likely to be a, a cost-controlled veteran. I could see that guy and Zach Moss splitting. And I could see Devin Singletary, who you don't cut because he's only like, you know, six hundred thousand dollars or whatever gets the cap next year. I could see him being the twenty twenty one TJ Yeldon, where he's the third back. A lot of inactivity for this guy, short of an injury. There's just something about him I don't like. So to answer your question, in terms of the offense, what you could do, I think finding a, a better running back that they trust more. I mean, Brandon Bean said it himself. He goes, "We don't have to run the football more often. We have to run it better." I don't think that's going to, I don't right. think you, what, what have you seen from Devin Singletary that says he's going to be better than what he was? And I think the offensive line, if they can get Daryl Williams back, I, they're going to run it back. So, you know, I, maybe they could do something schematically a little bit better, but it's hard to really criticize it. Cause yeah, they didn't run the ball that effectively, but guess what, man, look at all the yards Josh Allen threw for, you know, it was a very successful offense, a very good offense, except for Kansas city. Yeah, I, I love your point about McDermott. That's the one thing that first popped into my mind when I was watching that game. I, I said, you know, their their coaching 
af- afraid, especially of Tyreek Hill. And that's that's changed their whole mentality. It's changed their whole game plan. They were waiting for Kansas City to blow the game. That's what I it felt to me. I don't know yeah. if you agree. It felt like they were waiting for Kansas City to make the mistakes to to open up the gates for them instead of going out and aggressively trying to take it. And I don't like that. Yeah. I think they just have to not be afraid. I, I It showed you're trying to scheme and you're trying to do this and you're trying to, oh, we're afraid of this guy and we don't want to do this. And you lost. So just try, I mean, try to outscore him. I mean, just be aggressive. You know, try to outscore him. I think probably the one thing, and I'm not sure, I don't really care, I guess, where they get it if it's a it's if it's a, a wide receiver that maybe plays more snaps than McKenzie or if a, if it's a running back but I'd love to see them add a guy who the Chiefs had to be afraid of in terms of speed yeah I don't, I mean, you know I'm not sure who that is uh yeah I don't know either that's definitely the one the one thing that physically these teams could play 10 out of 10 times and the Chiefs speed is going to be a problem each and every single time now the one takeaway I will from the Super Bowl, the one thing that does stick with me that wasn't uh, an anomaly is the pass rush and what that means. Now, again, Kansas City had not just one, but both of their offensive tackles out for that game. And you're going against arguably the best defensive end combination in the NFL in terms of getting that to passer with, with uh, JPP and with Shaq Barrett. So that was just a recipe for disaster. That said... I do like Jerry Hughes, but I I do think priority one for the Bills this year, I think, over these next couple months, is to get a good pass-rushing defensive end. Somebody who, to me, is significantly better than Mario Addison, who wasn't terrible last year, but he clearly fell off, even from the three years in Carolina, where I think he had like nine, nine and a half, and 11 sacks the three years before coming to Buffalo. And the guy's 32 or 33 years old. So yeah. I don't think he's going to get better. They need to get a better pass rush. That was my point. The takeaway from Tampa Bay is you got to get after Mahomes, and the Bills just were terrible at getting after the passer against Kansas City. Mahomes had way too much time. Both times they played him this year. So that's why, and again, I'm not sure you know, when it's airs if he's going to be out there still or not. But I usually <laughs> don't put Watt. stock. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. I usually, <laughs> I'm not that guy, and there's people on Twitter Every single time a player gets caught from any team, he's automatically connected to the Bills. A lot of fans do that, podcasters, bloggers. I get that, but I don't do that, okay? But this is an exception. This is an exception. This is a guy who, man, you couldn't, yeah, he's 32 years old, and you're not going to get 2016, you know, J.J. Watt from five years ago. But if they can find a way to get him here, he's going to make a big difference. It's going to make a big difference. It's a great football fit for him. I don't know how it's going to work salary-wise, obviously. The Bills got to do a lot of work with or without a guy like J.J. Watt. But I'm talking football-wise. I don't think it's a better fit for him. I mean, you can argue maybe Cleveland because he'll never get double team because you have Miles Garrett on the other side. But in terms of, you know, he wants to win a ring. He wants to compete for a ring. Buffalo, which is funny to say, you know, you're a Bills fan. Yeah, it's been a long time time? coming. Yeah, Yeah, it's been a long time coming since you can have that attitude because for years and years and years, if a guy came to Buffalo, he came to Buffalo for one or two reasons. He came to Buffalo because the bills were going to overpay significantly more than someone else, or he came to Buffalo because nobody else wanted you. You know, you were almost a free agent outcast. You really didn't have any offers. So those are the two reasons. That's not the case anymore. Now people can come to Buffalo because they got a chance to win a ring. And some players are already talking about this, Charlie. This is the year with the cap going down, which in some ways is a detriment to the Bills because of Milano, and they're probably going to lose him. Maybe Darrell Williams. We'll see about that. But there's a lot of teams that are in bad cap situations. The upside for the Bills is there's going to be a lot of players willing to do one-year kind of rental deals so they can hit the market again when the cap goes back up. And for players like that, they want a chance to win. And again, Buffalo now provides you one of the best chances to win in the NFL. And in the case of J.J. Watt, more specifically at a position where he could come in and still feel like the man because he will be the man if he comes in and plays on this defensive line. He would just be a great fit for this team. I really would love to see something happen. I think he could be a big, big difference maker. Even if he could stay healthy, he could be the guy that puts the Buffalo defense over the top. 
Yeah, getting him would really do a whole lot. And then getting Star back from the opt-out, I think that, I mean, that would just be, you'd really get to see what Ed Oliver has to offer, I think. this That would be the first time where you could really see what he could do. And, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, J.J. Watt was like the second best in terms of you know, getting pressure, even though you're double teamed. I saw that on, on Twitter a couple weeks ago. And, you know, I was going to ask you a little bit about Milano. I, my feeling, too, is, he, is he's going to be gone just from the way Bean was talking about him, kind of the Jordan Phillips treatment from last year. And as, when the season started, I said, man, Milano, we, we can't lose that guy. We got to do whatever we can to keep him. And the season ended. And, and for me, like, yeah, we can find – a uh, sk- similar skill set in in the draft in free agency. Now you're not going to get a guy in the draft who's going to be able to, you know, read and react the way Milano has as a as a you know three or four year veteran. But I think that that skill set, the ability to cover, um, you know, run at the linebacker position, that I think that's pretty common now in the draft. What are your thoughts on Milano? And, you know, may, and maybe we can even transition that into this this big nickel that we've all been talking about. I feel like we've been talking about it forever now, but I guess the last 18 months. Yeah. Well, when it comes actually, before we get to Matt Milano, you hit on Ed Oliver, and I think that's important to at least hit on as well. It's not unrealistic to ask for more from Ed Oliver next year. And I know there's a lot of smart analytical yourself maybe as well might feel this way where the stats don't always tell the story with that Oliver. And that's fair. You know, a lot of film people say he played very well last year and at times that's true, but you know what? At the end of the day, Charlie, he is a, a top 10 pick and I don't think it's unreasonable to expect going in the year three better than the three sacks and the, I think he had five or six tackles for a loss for the season, maybe a forced fumble. You know what, Aaron Donald, and I've said this before on my show, DeForest Buckner, Chris Jones, these great defensive tackles, guess what? They get double team plenty as well. You know what I'm saying? So that's a lousy excuse. I do think Star Lotodale coming back will help them, will help him, I should say, for sure. In terms of Matt Milano, there's a difference between wanting him back and resigning yourself to him being gone. I want him back. Joe Biscaglia from The Athletic wrote, a piece about maybe a week or two ago saying that the bills could and that he would franchise tag him if necessary. That's not going to happen. I'd be stunned if the bills put the tag on him because you're talking like $15 million. And I just, I don't see that. Joe's reasoning was very good. By the way, he said, if you put the tag on him this year, it buys you a year of Tremaine Edmonds seeing if he's going to be worth that long-term deal because you would have to exercise that fifth-year option, which the Bills surely will, which remain. And then that gives you another year to decide if you want to pay this guy long-term. Because you can't have two long-term guys making, you know, $15 million each at the linebacker spot. I don't think you can anyway. But I want Matt Milano back. It's going to hurt losing him because, I mean, anybody, and again, this is not an analytical thing. This is a person who has a set of eyeballs that function properly. This defense was significantly better when Matt Milano played than when he didn't play. That was glaringly obvious. So I don't want to lose him. He's a great player. And again, you got to look at the totality of everything. Matt Milano was terrible against the Chiefs. Travis Kelsey was eating his lunch. But that's one game. You just, you can't look at it that way. Matt Milano is a very good player and I want him back. But I'm resigned to him leaving. This is definitely a position in the draft where I think they do address linebacker. I don't think there's, a linebacker out there that they're going to spend any significant money. And I could see a situation where they draft a guy in the first or second round and, uh, you know, maybe AJ Klein starts and this guy kind of works his way in kind of like when Milano was coming back from injury last season. I could see a situation like that. So I could see a a very early pick. Now, again, I haven't really started the, the study draft prospects yet. So I don't know him very well, but I know Mika Parsons from Penn state and, Nick Bolton from Missouri, those or Jabril Cox, especially from LSU. Yeah, yeah. Those could be really good fits. You know, with pick as maybe as high as pick 30, or they can move down a little bit or, or move up a little bit. Who knows how that would play out? But I could definitely see them going linebacker to replace Matt Milano if they lose him. I don't know big nickel prospects right now 
but I will tell you this, they need one. <laughs> you know, I'm not bringing any, any breaking news here. They need right. to be able to cover, you know, at the end of the day, and we can keep coming back to the same thing. And that's, you got to beat the Kansas City Chiefs, right? Well, you better be able to cover Travis Kelsey because the Bills have shown that they can't do that. And they they need a guy who who can cover him. And I don't think that guy's on this roster. I mean, I like Teron Johnson. He made some big plays, including, I mean, might have we might not have beaten Baltimore were not for that play. But I don't know, man. I, they got to do something on the defense, which is just kind of funny because if you and I were having this conversation 12 months ago, we'd be talking about the offense and they have to do this. And is Josh Allen going to earn that fifth year? Is he going to get that big contract? Does he have enough talent around him? And like, nah, those questions have been answered. It's the defense, which on a Sean McDermott team and a Leslie Frazier coordinated team is surprising to talk about. But, you know, defensive end, replacing Milano and maybe a big nickel. Those That's a lot of work to do this offseason with not a lot of cap room. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they handle this offseason. They're going to be active. Yeah. I just don't know how yet. Yeah, I agree. Before we circle back to uh, some more stuff about podcasting, we, we we have to at least mention this guy named Josh Allen. <laughs> yeah. I think it's it's pretty clear that he's going to get an extension. What I feel like there's a really good chance that he's going to be the second highest paid quarterback in the league, and I'm not saying he's going to approach the Mahomes per year average necessarily but i think right now to be the second highest paid i think it's like 41 42 um a year what are your thoughts on what a contract will look like for him i mean that mahomes contract the length and the term something obviously we've never seen in football what are your thoughts about josh and and they're obviously going to resign him, but what does the contract look like? There's been rumors that they're working on it now. Nothing significant's come out about that, but but there's been some rumblings about that. Well, look, <laughs> I have to take a step back sometimes and just admire how much he progressed in one year because I think back to my podcast and I think back to talking to other people, whether it was my show or on their show, about Josh Allen. And I vividly remember talking about he's going to have to go out and play good enough to even earn that fifth year option. This is his make or break year. This is year three. Is Josh Allen the franchise quarterback? Is Josh Allen the the face and the future of this franchise? And obviously he answered that resoundingly with yes. And it's funny because, you know, on my show, which just aired earlier this week, devoted almost the entirety of an episode on a fantasy world scenario. Now I, I got to re I got to emphasize this to you. It was for fun. It was fantasy world. Neither me and the guy who was on, do we think for two seconds that the bills will or should trade Josh Allen. So I want to make that very clear right now. Okay. But we played a game. We run around the NFL. We said, let's take everything into consideration. The player's contract, his age, his present, how he's playing now, what we project into the future. So 31 GMs would call me because I'm the new general manager of the Buffalo Bills and I'm offering my quarterback for you straight up in a trade. And at the end of the day, the only two quarterbacks, or actually it was three for me. There were three quarterbacks that I said I would trade Josh Allen for straight up. Patrick Mahomes obviously would be one. It took some debate, but Deshaun Watson was two. And then I went with Aaron Rodgers three, even though Aaron Rodgers is 37 years old, my philosophy was I'm going to have a two or three win year window with arguably the best quarterback in the NFL. So right. I want him and I'll worry about a quarterback a couple of years from now. <laughs> he gives me the better chance to win a couple of Super Bowls over the next few years. I love Josh Allen. I don't think he's quite as good as Aaron Rodgers right now. That's just, I know that might not play well with Bills fans, but that's how I feel. But anyway, here's my point. I had to struggle to find three quarterbacks in the entire NFL. I would trade Josh Allen for would have been saying that a year ago. It's insane how much he's grown. I can't think of many quarterbacks in the history of the NFL that have ever improved more from year one to year three year one. It was, you know, can this guy hit anything? You know, his accuracy is <laughs> terrible. Was he a, is he a good pick? Cause a lot of people didn't like the pick year two was, 
all right, well, he's getting better. But for whatever reason, even despite having a great arm, he couldn't throw a deep ball to save his life in 2019, if you remember. This year, yeah. he, he checked all the boxes. He checked all the boxes. I mean, he had a couple games that weren't great. I would say going forward now in the year four, the only thing, if people want to say, has he hit his ceiling yet? I would say almost, but not yet. And the only reason why, put it this way, if this is his ceiling and he plays like this for 10 more years, he's going to be going to the Hall of Fame someday, okay? The only ceiling he has that he hasn't hit yet is I think he, he should play better. He needs to play better in the postseason. Now, he played good against Indy. He was all right against Baltimore, and he was not very good against Kansas City. Last year against Houston, okay in the first half. Eh, fell apart a little bit in the second half. So I'd like to see him. I think the last step he's got to take is just to be a better player in the playoffs. Now, in terms of a deal, yeah, he's going to get a deal. Um, it's not a matter of of if, it's when. Is he going to get it this offseason or is he going to get it next offseason? And that matters because that will affect how the Bills sign players and attack the cap. Just like it's going to matter if Stefan Diggs gets a raise this year or next year. And I'm hoping that that'll be next year. So they have a little more flexibility <laughs> now. But I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a cap guy. I'm not an expert with finances. But, I, I mean, I can see a Deshaun Watson type offer. I, he's got like, what, a? Like hundred fifty million dollars or something like that. Uh, yeah, like like seventy, like seventy four million or something like that. He had guaranteed what over five years. Yeah, I could see him getting something like that. I think so. It's guaranteed, and yeah, yeah, I could see that for him. What What more do you need? What more can you ask for from him? The only thing you could possibly say is I want to see him do it again a second year, showing that last year wasn't a fluke. And I don't think anybody thinks that it was a fluke. But he's progressed. No. I mean, he's I drafted. He's grown. He's developed. You've had continuity. He's gotten better every year. He's clearly the face of your franchise. It's a no-brainer. I mean, I don't even think it's a consideration that they won't sign him. You just got to pray that you don't get yourself caught into a a Dak Prescott situation, like what goes on with Dallas these last couple of years, which, again, I don't think that's going to happen in Buffalo. But I don't know, man. Get Within reason, I guess, give him, a, give him a blank check. <laughs> he's earned it. You know, he's earned it. The, the Bills need him, and he ain't going nowhere. That much I can tell you. With confidence. No. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I wanted to, to touch on something else that you had you had said earlier when we were talking about podcasting in terms of relationships. And that was really my strategy as well. I wanted to build relationships with um, you know, Greg and Bruce and Joe and and Anthony Marino sure. and all these people. And I, I think when you start to do that as you mentioned for yourself, you start to unlock different doors. Um, you know, you get some credibility. People see that you've had this person on and maybe they're more willing to come on when you ask them. Uh, it You you know, different. you get access to different people because this person knows this person and all kinds of stuff like that. And I thought that that was really just a, a great point that you made about, about podcasting and, and relationships and and you've certainly turned it into something really outstanding. Well, I appreciate that. And look, relationships matter. And let me say this about Buffalo media. And I don't know how it is in other cities, but I, I could confident, confidently say this with Buffalo. And this is mainstream media. And then also like the bloggers fair and podcasting world, even with the mainstream media, those guys that I've had them all on my show at some points, and I've gotten to know a lot of them, you know, um, Sal. And, and again, this is a different year, obviously, because of COVID, but I'm talking about a typical year when you got the guys like the TV guys like Josh Reed and, and Matt Bove and Adam Benini, And then you got like Sal works for the Bills, of course, or WGR. And you got a lot of the writers like Matt Fairburn and, and Joe Biscaglia, Matt, uh, Matt Perino. It's not bullshit. It's real, man. These guys are they're pretty tight. You know, they're competitive. They're competitive. They want to beat each other. Matt Perino wants you to read his story before you read Matthew Fairburn's story. Do you know what I'm saying? But yeah, they're helpful to each other. And uh, they got good relationships and they, and they spend time together on the road. Now, podcast is a little bit different because it's not a physical relationship like these guys have. And, and a lot of the girls in the media, too. Um, but it, it, it is a, it's a very good relationship. And I think genuinely and i know some people might think it's phony but it's not a lot of the guys you mentioned bruce and greg and anthony marino 
and uh and Joe, Joe Marino um or Joe Miller I'm sorry and, and you know and Aaron Quinn and some of the guys at Fanatics they're good Rico Mathis see, they're, they're good people they really are and I've had them all on my show and I've done right. some of their shows um very helpful to each other and at the end of the day sure yes I want people to listen to my podcast and and you can't forget this and you you know you'd be neglecting yourself to say, well, it doesn't matter because it does matter because you're putting in the time, you're putting in the effort. You want people to listen to your show. And if someone's only got a half hour of their day to give and it's going to be your show or it's going to be my show, you want people to listen to your show. You'd be crazy if you didn't have that attitude. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But yeah, right. that doesn't mean that you can't be there for the other people and help them out. One thing I take a lot of pride in more than anything you might hear on the air and I'm sure a couple of these guys would uh, attest to this. I try to be as helpful as I can. And I'm not even talking about, hey, you could come on my show and you could promote this or vice versa. I'm talking about, listen, so when you're putting your show together, I can hear this. Um, you know, I'm not going to name say a name, but there's a really good podcaster out there. But he was having a, an issue where I was listening to a show and you could just hear the the heavy breaths in between every other word he was taking to a point that it got like distracting. You know what I'm saying? Things like right. that. And I'm like, you should try this kind of noise gain and maybe reduce that just a little bit. It would make a big difference. So it's also technical things like that. And uh, yeah, they're good people, man. And they really truly are. And just to highlight one of them. And I keep going back to him all the time is, is Bruce. Bruce is a special guy. Bruce is a guy that if he wanted to, if Bruce Nolan, and I, of course that's his alias, if Bruce Nolan wanted to make a living being a podcaster and a bills and an analysis, analyst, I should say, duh, he would be. Because again, he does it better than anyone. He's got a good voice. He's naturally smart. I always tell him, like, say this to me like I'm 10 years old. <laughs> because he's saying shit in ways that I can't even grasp sometimes. But he's also extremely well prepared like he does two shows a week i'm telling you man he spends hours at a time for each show having very meticulous notes and knowing what he's going to say and the points that he wants to make and having a lot of numbers to back it up and i'm sure you know this it's a lot of work to do that but anyway bruce is just an incredibly generous guy and so is joe and and so is aaron and greg and they really are the relationships matter a lot because they're more helpful even though you're competing against these people, it's still more helpful to to have them on your side than to be against you at the end of Definitely. the day. Definitely. And that's kind of the thing that surprised me at first. You know, I, I kind of looked at them as these larger than life figures when I first started getting into it because I had listened to them and even like approaching somebody like Ryan Talbot, who was one of my first guests. Great guy. Yeah, I I was surprised that they said yes, <laughs> even though like and my strategy was to interact with all of them as often as possible, listen to every episode. So then when I did start podcasting and I did reach out to them, they, they could say, Oh, I remember that guy from Twitter last week or whatever the case may be. And I didn't really expect them to say yes necessarily, but they did. And, and that was so great. And it was very surprising, but the, the further, I got into the community, I realized that they were really trying to be helpful and everybody wanted to be helpful. You know, I, I don't think I've run across anyone who, who wasn't willing to be helpful and sure. I want them to listen to my show before, you know, they listen to anything at fanatics, but, but at the same time or whoever, but at the same time, like I said, I listen to every podcast. At least yeah. I try to once a week. There's something out there for everybody. You want to know the secret? You know, like they're all good. They're just all different. Let me tell you the secret. You want to know the secret why so many people like to be on podcasts? Who doesn't? Let me ask you this, Charlie. Who doesn't like talking about themselves? Yeah, right. I've gotten a chance to talk about myself more in this podcast with you, then I get a chance to two months worth of <laughs> worth of doing my own shows. It, it's fun. And you know, you mentioned one name and I want to hit on him. Brian Talbot to me represents the dream, like what you can become 
because it wasn't too long ago. And Ryan was always a pretty good blogger. But Ryan, for quite a while, was just blogging, posting news. A lot of it was kind of just general news, like kind of recycled news, but on the blog. And he just got better at doing it. And he got more talented over time and work and practice. And then he started developing some relationships with players or scouts and agents and stuff like that. And then Ryan started scooping some news. You know, he started breaking some news. He became a legitimate news reporter. And then the podcast came along with Matt Perino at NewYorkUpstate.com, a Shout Buffalo football podcast. That podcast is doing really good. Ryan's really carving out a name for himself. Last year, I mean, again, COVID screwed everything up this year. But last year, Ryan, again, he went from in a matter of a couple of years being what, 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 what do we like to call it? A basement blogger. He went from that <laughs> to, he went to Houston, Texas to cover a Bills playoff game in the press box. You know what I'm saying? That's right. That's a big deal. And it's a big step. And he's the kind of, he's an example that good things could happen when you work hard, when you're very generous with your time and, and make allies like Ryan does. Ryan is, man, you, well, you know this, Ryan will do almost any show. Ryan will do any podcast in the world if he can find the time to do it. Cause it's just, <laughs> He likes to talk about the Bills, and he's just a really generous guy. But he, and he's also very talented. But yeah, that just goes back to talk about uh, you know, the relationships and how much they matter. And and again, it does matter in a very saturated, crowded uh, market. It's all about you know what, Charlie. At the end of the day, first and foremost, when it comes to a podcast, you got to figure out what lane you want to be in, like. I feel like there's three, okay? There's the the pure hobby podcast. And if it's purely for hobby, and that's like somebody who they really don't care how many listeners they get. They really don't care what the sound quality is. They just want to get, they want to hit record, or they want to hook up with one or two of their buddies, tape something, put it up there, and whoever listens, listens, and they really don't care. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want to do, have at it, have fun. That's cool. So that's like the pure hobby. Then there's the, the side hustle. You know, the side hustle is somebody who is, they're not doing it full time. You know, they got a regular job or at least they work part time another job, but they put a lot of work and a lot of effort into their podcast. Um, they sacrifice some things. It's very time consuming for sure. And, uh, you know, you give up some stuff. I kind of consider myself to this point in that a side hustle means you, you can make some money, you get some sponsors but you're not like doing it as a career. It's not your only job. It's not your career. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So there's that. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. Then there's the, the, the game changer, you know, the potential full-time career, you know, the professional one. That's very, 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 very difficult to do. To make a living doing podcasting and nothing else. I mean, there are people who do it and do it successfully, but not many, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, right. find your lane. Like, if you're out there and you're considering starting a podcast, or if you do have a podcast and you're new at it, spend some time figuring out, like, what are your goals? Like, what do you want to do? Do you just want to do this for fun? Are you just having a good time? And that's really the end game for you, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. Or do you want to make it into like a, a quality second job? Do you want, are you looking for a certain amount of subscribers or downloads per episode, things like that? Or do you want to do it full time? And again, a lot of these people, I would say most people that I know anyway are kind of like in that middle bracket. There's a couple grinders like Joe Marino has four or five podcast episodes a week. I mean, that dude just grinds his ass off, but yeah. you know, not too many people do that. But anyway, that, that I think that's important, man. You got to really, you kind of got to find your lane. That's the big thing. And then, like I said, the other thing is either be unique, do something a little different, bring something different to the table or just do what everyone else is doing, but do it better than them. Before I let you go, there's one thing that I have to talk to you about, and I just want to say that you have, or I'm I'm assuming it's still there, you have the most comprehensive <laughs> ranking and review list of <laughs> restaurants that serve chicken wings yeah. in the western New York area, and that's very impressive to me. <laughs> that's just fantastic and i will say for <laughs> clarification my wife is going to want me to tell you that my brother-in-law 
my son and her all work at the Wellington Pub. So Wellington Pub's pretty good <laughs> on Hurdle Avenue. Yes. Yeah, they're pretty good. In fact, you know, I'm thinking I'm I have them like all right, let me put this disclaimer out there because this is important. If I told you a, a list of let's just say 80, let's take this let's use a number 80. And I said, all right, you are the 40th best player on this team out of 80. <laughs> it doesn't sound too flattering. That means right. you're pretty much middle of the pack, right? Well, Buffalo wings to me are different. If I say that your wings are middle of the pack, that's pretty good because wings in Buffalo, like put it this way, like the Wellington pub might be a middle of the pack wing in Buffalo. Bring them down to Florida. You bring that shit to Florida. It's an exquisite elite chicken wing. Anyway, yeah. I do have them ranked. I have them ranked. So I have different tiers. All right. I take this shit way too serious. <laughs> I have, I have the Mount Rushmore wings, which is just four. Then I have a group that's called the elite wings. And then I have a group that's all pro wings. Then I have a group that's solid starters, which is by the way, is where I have uh, the Wellington pub. Then I have depth chart wings. Like those are wings that like, and I even have little things. Let me backtrack a little bit. Mount Rushmore and Elise <laughs> speak for themselves. All pro wings, I compared them to Tredavious White, like Nate Owen was Ruben Brown. And then I got solid starters. I'm talking like Cole Beasley, Ted Washington, Jim Hazlitt. Then right. I got like depth chart wings. Those are like Kenneth Davis, Spencer Long, who got cut, whatever. Frank Wright wings. <laughs> and then I got right. my last ones were, or actually two, roster bubble wings. Those are like Jason Kroom, Eddie Yarbrough. You know, those are wings <laughs> that like, are on the cusp of making the 53 man roster, but you don't know yet. And then last but not least, I got a uh, waiver wire wings. Those are like, don't quit your day job. If you're trying to be an NFL football player, <laughs> I got those, but yeah, I like the Wellington pub, man. They're, they're good. And the funny thing is with the wings, I lived in Buffalo again. I lived in Buffalo for over 40 years, man. I only had, when I lived in Buffalo, I went to the same three, four places all the time. I didn't really experiment. I didn't try many different things. I went to, my wife is from Lackawanna. So we lived out in the South Towns a lot and I love Bella pizza. So I always got pizzeria wings from Bella, um, 9-11. Cause again, that's in South Buffalo and in Duff's just because of how popular it were. Those were pretty much the places I always went to. When I moved to Florida in 2016, I didn't know it at the time, but the chicken wings in Florida are trash. Absolutely horrible. They're horrible. They're terrible. So every time I came back to Buffalo, now I work remotely from home. So I, I was before, again, before COVID, I was coming back home three times a year, at least I was spending five, six weeks a year at a minimum in Buffalo. I started doing this list where I went to all these places and would try chicken wings and I would, uh, write a little review and I would compare them to a quarterback. No matter what I was a present quarterback, <laughs> past, <laughs> present, whatever. Um, and it was fun and it caught on. In fact, I got annoyed because it got to a point where people were caring more about my wing takes and my sports takes. You know, that was kind of <laughs> pissing me off a little bit, but yeah. you know, that's just the way it goes, which by the way, pisses me off. Another thing is now because I'm not in Buffalo full time, at least not back yet. Nate Gary and Marcel Luis Jacques are stealing all my damn thunder with wings and food takes and stuff like that. So I'm letting them know that I'm coming back for that shit this summer. I'm coming <laughs> back. I'm coming back for that crown. <laughs> but seriously, I, I, lo I love wings and it just became something that really, it took off for me. So at this point, I, I reviewed in power rank 67 uh, different spots. So at least right, Wellington one, Ball one was more, in the top half. One more wing question for you okay. before we go. I feel like the the next frontier of the chicken wing has arrived, right? It used to be like a good crispy, like hot wing or medium wing. And I feel like it's transitioned into how many different flavors a place has, right? Instead of just like the quality of like how it's cooked and how it's sauced. It's like the creativity behind it am, am i accurate in how because i don't get out much really because all my kids and everything but that's how i feel it seems like to me yeah it does i've even had to and again i don't take this list too serious i don't 
for the most part, people don't either. So I don't want to get too technical here, <laughs> but I have attempted to moderate the way I compare, like when I put these rankings together, because there are, and you're right, there's wings in places like, uh, like um, Bar- well, Barbell has a, a decent amount of wings, but, or different flavors, I should say, but a place like 911, if you want wings at 911, you know what you're getting? Hot or medium or go home, go somewhere else. You know, there's not a lot of places right. like that anymore. Um, Macy's Place Pizzeria, I've absolutely fallen in love with their wings. They're one of those places that you're talking about. They're so creative. They're coming up with peanut butter, whatever wings and hot honey mustard and stuff. These kind of things they are just coming up with new flavors every day. And there are more and more places that are uh, getting more unique and creative and coming up with wings, which makes it harder to grade though. because I don't know. Like I said, I try to put an emphasis on the traditional wing. And then like, if I go to a place right now, I try to get two flavors. I always get hot medium or hot or medium, depending. And then I try to get whatever their signature variety flavor is, which varies. But to answer your question, you're hundred percent right. It's becoming more and more common now when people go out for wings. Well, what kind of wings did you get? It used to always be, well, I got some hot, I got some medium. Or if you wanted to be fancy, I got some, you know, some hot barbecue wings. Yeah. But like I said, now it's, now it's Cajun. What, I love Cajun, so I probably shouldn't talk shit about it. But, you know, maple <laughs> syrup and, as I said, peanut butter, pizza right, flavored, right. you name it. And there's, you know, Hawaiian punch wings. There's just, you name it. Whatever it is, <laughs> they keep coming out with new ones. Well, I'm going to keep trying them, so I'm not really complaining. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you and your podcast and all that stuff? Yeah. Talking Buffalo podcast every Tuesday, every Friday, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Pat Moran tweets. And of course the podcast is on all the major podcasting platforms out there, Apple and Google, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it. They're all over the place. So yeah. Talking Buffalo podcast Tuesday and Friday at Pat Moran on tweets. It was a lot of fun, man. I'm really, really, it was a, Nice conversation. It was relaxing. I, I like talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and take, giving me some of your time to, to talk on the podcast. Uh, no problem at all, man. I really appreciate uh, being on. This was fun. Thanks, Pat. Take care. Well, I would like to thank Pat Moran once again for coming on the podcast today. I would like to thank everyone for listening. Once again, we are part of the Bills Brawl. This is the Podcaster's Corner show you are listening to. My name is Charlie Gross. You can find me on Twitter at Charlie underscore Gross underscore. We'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast, Leave us a review, any comments that you'd you'd like, anything that we can approve on. We'd appreciate it. We are part of the Brawl Network. We encourage you to check that out. A lot of good stuff on there. A lot of good people working at the Brawl Network. And as always, Bills Mafia, find a way to embrace your growth mindset. And as always, trust the process. Home game for the playoffs, but you already snow. Gabe Davis is a rookie, but he playing like a pro. Uh, going through a table, only time we ever fold. Can you dig it? 17, by to take us to the bowl. Hey, uh, don't you run it? No. Oliver and Trey Edmonds gonna be on it. on it. We got Corey, but we barely ever punt it. Never. Cause we just running up the score on our opponent. Uh.